I'm going to do something a little bit different than I normally do. As some of you know, I'm an art teacher at a high school in Mississippi. Not only do I do comic books and graphic novels, but uh, I, I actually teach an art class. Some of my students might be watching right now. Hi, everybody. Sorry that I can't be with you, but pandemics, what you going to do? Uh, today, what I'm going to do is we're going to be talking about some of the things we would have been talking about in our classroom had we been in the classroom. So uh, I'm going to continue my classroom lectures and we're just going to get into it, distance learning and everything like that. Social, dis social distancing. Now, to start talking about art history, we're actually going to start in prehistory. What does prehistory mean? Well, as I'm sure you know, the prefix pre means before, all right? So what is history? Well, history means you have written something down, all right? So prehistoric art means before a written record. Our story about prehistoric art begins in the year 1879, when a man named Marcelino di Sautuola took his five-year-old daughter with him exploring in a nearby cave. Now, you might ask yourself, why would he go exploring in a cave with his five-year-old daughter? I know, right? I mean, what could go wrong with that? So, now, if you've ever seen a five-year-old walk, they pretty much look everywhere except where they're walking, right? Uh, so, here, I could just imagine it. So, here's, here's Sautuola with a torch in his hand, walking along. Here's his daughter walking behind him, looking at everything. Marcelino de Sautuola is usually credited with discovering prehistoric art. However, it was actually his daughter, Maria, who discovered it, because she looked up at the ceiling. And she said, and I quote, Papa, mira, los toros. Daddy, look, the bulls. When he directed his attention not at the floor, looking for bottomless pits that his beloved child might fall into, but he looked instead at the ceiling, he saw all these wonderfully painted horses and bulls and cows and all kinds of other things like that. Unfortunately for Mr. Sautola, when he first of all, uh, you know, made his discovery known to the world, a lot of people didn't believe him. In fact, some people basically just said he was making it up, said he was a liar, that he was just, there was no way this could have been true. Now, a couple of reasons in their defense of why they thought it couldn't be true. One reason was some of the paint that uh, these things were made out of appeared to be still kind of wet, which there's no way, right? I mean, there's no way it could last for thousands of years from the last ice age and still be wet, right? Ah, except here's a couple of things I want you to think about. The average temperature of a cave worldwide is around 55 degrees Fahrenheit with a relatively constant humidity. Think about it this way. There's no wind, there's no light, there's no uh, things to dry stuff out. So if you're using a paint made of natural materials, natural pigments like uh, gypsum, or you know, charcoal from burnt sticks or burnt wood, um, iron oxide, reddish dirt, which has rust in it, a high iron content. All these different colors, naturally occurring materials, they would mix these with fat or grease or blood, and then they would paint them on the walls. Now, if you paint these on a wall in a very cool place with a high humidity, it acts like a refrigerator, keeps it nice and fresh for a very long time. As I said, a lot of people considered Marcelino de Salatola a complete, utter fraud. They said this is fake, that he had done these things himself, the paint was still wet, there was no way it could have been uh, as old as he was claiming. Another reason they doubted him, they said, you know, there are paintings of rhinos, and there are no rhinos in Europe. Ah. Well, it turns out this was actually a mark in de Salatola's favor because before the last ice age, there actually were rhinos in Europe. That's one of the things that proved they were genuine. What saved him was geology. Let's sidetrack for a second, take a little digression into the science of geology. If you know anything about geology, which is the study of rocks, it rocks, right? Um, you have to think about how caves are made, right? Where do we find caves? In the ground. Yes, in the ground, exactly. We mostly find them in limestone. Now, there's a reason why we find them in limestone. So here's the ground. Let's say there's a crack in the ground. 
Now, the crack in the ground lets in things like rainwater. Now, the rainwater, even back then, before industrialization, it still has a slightly acidic pH balance for those of you that are scientific minded. Now, what happens when you mix an acid, the rain, with a base, the limestone? Well, there's a chemical reaction, and basically one dissolves the other. The rainwater will dissolve the limestone. So we have rain up here, which percolates down through the crack and sometimes can make a larger and larger opening. That's what the kids are calling a cave. As more rainwater over the course of thousands of years drips through, it dissolves the calcium carbonate in the ground and puts it in suspension in the water. One of the sounds you will hear in caves, and I don't know if you've ever been in a cave, but if you've ever been in a cave, one of the constant sounds you hear is yeah, that's it. That's it. Right, it's water dripping through. When water drips in a cave, it leaves behind some dissolved minerals. It leaves some at the very top, and that builds up over the years, and it leaves some at the bottom where it splashes down, and that also builds up over the years. Now, I'm sure that you recognize that in caves, you have all of these formations that are happening that you can bonk your heads on, and they kind of look like teeth. I'm sure you know, too, that the words stalactites and stalagmites are things you find in caves. Which one is which? Ah, glad you asked. Let me tell you how that works. A stalactite hangs tight to the ceiling. Stalactites. Stalagmites, you might trip over them. So, <laughs> stalactites. <laughs> Stalag mites. Now, what happens when a stalactite and a stalagmite meet in the middle? Ah, you get what's called a column. Now, how long does this take? Well, it depends. To get a big, thick column takes hundreds and thousands of years. It takes a really long time. Stalactites and stalagmites and columns don't always happen right in the middle of a cave. Sometimes they happen right at the edge. Now, when they happen right against a wall, it's called a flow stone. All right, I'm going to put my flow stone right here. <laughs> I just noticed the other day that the National Park Service has put uh, several live virtual tours on the, uh, on the internet. So if you go to Carlsbad Caverns, and I'll try to find the link and put it down below in the comments or something like that, um, there are some magnificent examples of stalactites, stalagmites, columns, and flowstones in Carlsbad Caverns. The flowstone is what saved Marcelino de Sautuola's reputation. Remember Marcelino de Sartuola? We were talking about him, yeah. What saved him was the fact that some of these flowstones were actually covering up parts of the artworks. So you had cows or bulls or things like that, some of them partially covered by these deposits of geological things. That's what saved his reputation. It proved that they were not done instantly. Because, I mean, how could you paint behind a rock formation that's been there for 10,000 years? Y you can't. Geology saved his reputation. Now, let's talk about the artwork of the prehistoric time for a second. First of all, it was not art in the same way that we think about art. Uh, it's not like the cavemen were in their cave going, gee, you know, I'd really like to paint something on the walls here. I'd really like to spruce the place up and, you know, have something to go with my couch. That's not what they were thinking. What they were doing was more along the lines of what we think of as magic. Now, when I say magic, I don't mean... Abracadabra. Presto Changeo! Out of my hat, a rabbit! Pull a rabbit out of a hat. 
poof, that kind of magic. What I mean is magic more akin to early religion. More like a good luck charm or a magic spell. Something to give you control over something. Uh, a chance for mankind uh, to feel like he has some sort of control over the environment. Uh, which, in times like these, can be pretty, uh, you know. A lot of people in Hancock County, Mississippi, where I live and teach, a lot of people go hunting. Hunting is not necessarily finding. It's also not the same as catching. If you are relying on hunting to support your family, to make sure everybody in your tribe has something to eat, to make sure you all stay fed and healthy, you might want all the help you can get, all the good luck you can have, anything that will help ensure that there are enough animals walking by so that you, know, you can throw your spear and bring one down, a good luck charm, a lucky rabbit's foot, a four-leaf clover, a lucky rock, whatever you got, that's what you might want to have. So what we do see a lot of is we see a lot of animals, we see a lot of bulls, cows. Interestingly enough, we don't see any foreshortening, we don't see any three-dimensionality, and we almost always see the animals from the side view. A very simplified version, yeah, but we never see them as if the animals walking towards us. Kind of looks like a weird smiley face there, doesn't it? Yeah, but we don't see it that way because the artists didn't ever portray it that way. They always portrayed it in a very easily recognizable kind of way. So you would see, you know, uh, almost like stick figures. And sometimes we have seen, archaeologically speaking, evidence that people have been, uh, had been hunting them or using them magically, like throwing spears at them, causing chips to happen and things like that. Again, a lot of people have conjectured that this is a method of gaining control over the spirit of the animal. Now, I'll tell you about that word, conjecture. Conjecture is an interesting word. It's a scientific word that makes you sound very, eh, very smart. If you say, well, it's just conjectural, but basically what it means is it's a guess. I guess this is what they were thinking because we just don't know. Why don't we know what they were really thinking? Because it's prehistoric. Once people started writing things down in their societies, we know a whole lot more about what they were thinking because they wrote it down and told us. Cave art, not so much. We don't really get that. One more thing about prehistoric art. And I find this fascinating because in almost every single site that has ever been found of prehistoric art, you find the same thing. You find handprints. Now, you either find positive handprints where somebody dips their hand into paint and then smudges it up against the wall, or you will find them in negative where somebody puts their hand up against the wall, takes a tube, like a, a reed or a piece of bamboo or something, sucks up some pigments or paint in their, their mouth and blows it out around their hand. The first spray paint taggers of history right there. That's amazing. Boy! So, that's good. So, what's our artistic adventure for today? What's the assignment for this, uh, this particular lesson? Here's what I want you to do. I want you to think about your current situation. Your current situation, I gotta tell you, it's pretty odd right now, isn't it? <laughs> if you wanna mention the coronavirus or why we're all in quarantine, think about that. I want you to figure out a way to write out your story without using any words. We have to use what's called a pictograph. Now, pictographs are fairly simple uh, kind of pre-writing, right, if you will. A lot of uh, the, the cave paintings, a lot of prehistoric art involves pictographs. Pictographs are a little like stick people. I mean, if you're talking about people. If you're talking about animals or something like that that you want to have around, it's a very simplified method of showing what it is. So let's just try to think about a story for a second. First of all, if I were drawing a person, I might try to give some sort of indication of what a person looks like. A head. Some arms. Maybe some legs. 
there you go. That's pretty simplified. Now, if I was trying to be more specific, I might get very specific. <laughs> Seen that guy before? I don't know. Now also think about, it's a simplified version. You get the important parts that are there, but you leave out the unimportant parts. So, we have cars, right? So for instance, what are the important parts of a car? Well, wheels, the body of a car, windows. Pretty simple. Now, if I were trying to tell a story about that person, I might think about uh, ways to show different people. For instance, if we have the protagonist of our story, what might this be? And, what might that be? So we might have a family right here. Uh, we might say, they went someplace. How would we say they went someplace? Well, that's what you've got to figure out. Now, one thing I will tell you, oftentimes people have used something like legs to indicate this group of people went someplace. How long did it take them to go? Well, you can't use numbers. You can't use words and letters. Sometimes in some societies, people have used suns and moons to indicate the passing of time. They traveled for days. Hmm, interesting. Okay, now, maybe they saw something. A lot of times, in various prehistoric societies, people have used an eye to indicate that they saw something. Now, here's a tricky part. How can you tell if you're talking about seeing something or an actual context? That's really how you can figure it out, is just context. All right, so here you go. No words, no languages. Uh, you just have to make up symbols. Can you use numbers? No. Can you use concepts like, hey, I have an idea. Bing, light bulb above my head. No. How long does the story have to be? As long as you think it needs to be. Perhaps a page, perhaps half a page. Try it out. See if you can come up with an idea for how to express some things without using words, using only pictographs. Now, for you crazy kids and your phones these days, you got it easier than a lot of people do because you're already used to using pictures and symbols to represent ideas and emotions. What are they called now? Emojis! That's right. Okay, so we'll talk more about this in our next lesson about ancient Egypt. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Wash your hands. Be safe. Take care of each other. Be kind to each other. And we'll all get through this together, okay?